Three, two, one. This is The Jungle, an up-close, unvarnished look inside leadership and business strategy. We wade into the real world leader's face and explore what they do to create a path forward because that's what business is. Wild, exciting, it's The Jungle. Welcome back to The Jungle. Derek, how you doing? Good. It's been a while, Doug. It's been a little bit since we did one of these. You've been a little bit busy. We, we, we have been crazy busy uh, in a good way. Very impactful stuff, but it's been. What, tell the listeners what, 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 what's, what's been on your plate the last, the last month since we, we did a podcast. Well, well, first I got to apologize to our guests because, you know, I'm still working from home and my internet was crashing. It was, we did a late night one and there was so much stream into my house that my internet was crashed. I couldn't answer a question. And then I actually pinged out at the, <laughs> it died. Um, but uh, part of that's because, it, you know, I'm excited because we're starting to see a little bit opening up, uh, maybe a little bit early, but for stuff going on, you know, our first close of our fund is coming up quickly so trying to deal with all that uh first first deal likely coming up before the end of this month um so lots on both of those accounts which is keeping us lots of busy the acquire program the second second round of that just finished uh this week uh so that's exciting we got 40 person wait list for the next cohort which is which is exciting. And then accelerator and acquire is our, for folks tuning in for the first time, that's the, our, 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 uh, training program on uh, small business acquisition. Yep. Yep. Small business. Ac- a lot of great candidates that, that I'm, we're going to have one-on-ones with and hopefully some, uh, go down the path because there's a big, big opportunity of, of for small business acquisition, which is, you know, the heart of, of our economy, the heart of, of the Midwest. Uh, so lots there, uh, we have our project with our undergrads with Hayworth, which is going fantastic. You know, that those experiences always bring out a lot of emotion, a lot of intensity, a lot of hard work on our part and on the students part. So, uh, you're leading that. So lot, you know, you're, you're, you're taking charge there because we, you know, we've just got a lot on our plate and, and, but we're, 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 we're pushing through all the, all the hurdles, all the boundaries and, and we're being successful. So, we're executing at a high level and, and it's just, there's just a lot going on there and hopefully the accelerator will be done soon. Uh, you know, lots of areas for people to help out. So if you want to help out or you know, get in contact with us, but just lots, lots happening. That's good. And lots of people are helping us. So we should probably thank all those people that are outside that are, you know, from outside the university that are well, the, coming yeah, in that- to help us in terms of any resources they can provide us to help, you know, make an impact on a student's life. Which we're, is- we're scaling, right? We're scaling. And, and I think our guests also spoke to the, the generosity of West Michigan and, and how important that is in terms of higher education and, and, and kind of growing our, our economy here. So uh, we had the, the, the great honor of having Representative Peter Meyer on the podcast. He is the congressman for Michigan's third congressional district, a freshman representative who has walked into a whirlwind of the last uh, three months uh, in his term. Uh, Great to spend time uh, with the congressman. He represents both uh, Grand Rapids and Battle Creek. Derek, what what were your takeaways from the conversation? Yeah. So again, I got to apologize to Peter for my internet issues. You know, I, I got to say sorry again. I'm Canadian, so I say sorry lots. Uh, but uh, so, you know, I liked his community focus and and the community focus of the Midwest and West Michigan. You know, that's how how our fund operates. That's how we operate. So it's it's really exciting to hear that. But my takeaway was, and this is probably from his military background, his his sense of humility and his, and his mission and purpose focus. Um, and he had a line in there. If, if, if people are committed to the mission, one thing you never hear is that's not my job. Uh, that's not my role. Uh, and, and I really like that line at the center, the students that work in our center, we ask them to do all kinds of things, right? A lot of the students around campus you see sitting at their job, working on homework and stuff, but our students work nonstop and we ask them to do anything and everything. And they're willing to do it. And you and I, you know, day in and day out where there's always something different. So I really like that. Uh, you know, if, if you're a mission driven individual and, and you have a sense of purpose, you rarely hear words like that's not my job or that's not my responsibility uh, yeah. or I'm not accountable for that is, is another way of putting that uh, yeah. or pointing at someone else. So 
I like, I, I really like that statement from him. He was a really humble individual. It was our first time, my first time talking with him. So it was really nice to, to, to kind of chat with him a little bit. Doug, what, what, I mean, what was your takeaway? So lots of good, lots of good nuggets in there for me. Uh, the one that I really liked was how he deals with all of the competing interests he's trying to serve both his constituency, which has uh, great diversity in terms of what they're, they're looking for, uh, both within his party and then outside of his party. Uh, but then all the diversity in, in terms of the different constituencies in Congress. And, you know, his answer to how do you manage all of that, which business owners are thinking of how they manage lots of different stakeholders, uh, was going back to principles. And, you know, our center uh, is, is big on the notion of principles, finding that those things that it really can, can guide you in terms of your, your value system. And having that as a touchstone, you know, he said, without that, trying to figure out who, who's sitting where in all these different uh, points of view is just going to drive you crazy. So I really like this idea of, of finding what your principles are. That's something leaders can do tomorrow, start to identify those and kind of use those as, as part of your decision-making, not something on the wall, not something just as part of your culture, but something that you use to make decisions, I think is really nice. Well, Doug, I'd like to think you and I are still kind of young, especially for professors, but th this freshman class, they haven't even been in two months yet, right? So this recording, all the stuff that, that they're dealing with from those diverse stakeholders on every issue. I don't think there's been a time of uh, starting two months, at least in my you know understanding of uh, you know United States and politics, that a, a freshman class has had quite like this of all the stuff they've had to go through this early, this fast. Um, Pandemic, so insurrection, <laughs> uh, big, uh, big you know stimulus bills coming through, uh, shootings, uh, just impeachment all of decision, it. impeachment, I mean, just, yeah, yeah, all kinds of stuff. So yeah. uh, and. and that's the world of today, right? Social media, just everything is news and, and all the time. So lots there, but he was, he was a great individual to just chat with for a little bit and, and, and hear his perspective. So a great listen for our listeners. So we hope, yeah. So with that, we hope everybody enjoys uh, our conversation with Congressman Peter Meyer. The Jungle is produced by the Center for Principled Leadership and Business Strategy in Western Michigan University's Hayworth College of Business. Our center supports the leadership and business strategy major, conducts large-scale consulting projects, and trains professionals in acquiring and operating small businesses. To learn more, visit wmich.edu forward slash leadership center. Representative Meyer, thanks so much for joining us on The Jungle. Thank you for having me, Doug and Derek. Do you have a, do you have a beverage? I have a, a Diet Coke right here. I know it's not the most exciting, but... Cheers. Good day. Cheers. I have... Uh, this is the this is the new I don't know if it's new but the watermelon Lacroix. I heard someone call it Lacroix the other day, Derek. It's not good. Clearly not from right. Michigan. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you so much for for joining us. We know that it's it's got to be a, a wild time for you. Uh, lots of things going on, um, and I know our listeners probably would love to start off with just getting an understanding of what is walk us into what your first impressions now in Congress of are like. I mean, you've been through quite a bit in the last three months. What, what's, what's your impression like? Yeah, I mean, this is the first time I've served in office. And so I, I can only trust some of those who've been there a little bit longer than I have that it's not usual to have an insurrection three days into your term and then an impeachment 10 days in. Um, I would certainly say that it was if I felt going in that this was a pivotal time for the country and, and one uh, where we saw the clashing of a lot of forces and expectations. The past two and a half months have, have just reinforced that on almost a daily basis. But it's been a, a, a wonderful experience, both getting to know some of the colleagues out there, understanding the contours and, and, and where there is room for agreement, where there's room for action, and also having to navigate, again, a very dynamic political environment where you know, the Republican Party finds itself in the minority in all three um, main bodies in the White House, the Senate and the House. And the Democrats are, you know, flexing their muscles on a near daily basis. So I've been I've been enjoying that that dynamic while always remembering, you know, what it is we're there to do, how to make sure that we don't let those stressors or dynamics of the moment 
confused from the responsibility to be focused on long-term governance, to be focused on how we can ensure that the country is moving in the right direction uh, and not just get distracted but by whatever the outrage or, or flavor of the day is. Do you, do you have any surprises, you know, now that you're there, the, you know, is it the food or the people or the process or like behind the scenes, is there any interesting surprises or discoveries you've had? I'm surprised by some of the folks who are maybe a little bit less vocal externally. They don't have the, the media presence or aren't fixtures on, on cable news, but are nonetheless passionate, dedicated, and, and oftentimes leading the conversation internally. And I guess the inverse of that are the people who are um, you know, on the news a lot and, and maybe household names, but are more focused on brand building than actually getting support behind a piece of legislation or even offering ideas. You know, the amount of votes that we've had come up where if it doesn't fit neatly along a, a party line, uh, so you don't just have the safety of voting with your group, or where uh, leadership isn't recommending or whipping votes in one direction or the other, how debilitating and confused some can get because they say, well, I, I don't know what to think on this. And, and that's led to some very productive discussions where um, you know, I've, I've enjoyed talking as, as folks go through that kind of intellectual process and trying to, to be judicious on an issue. But it's also led to, um, if, I, if I have a disappointment at some of the uh, colleagues who are less interested in, in finding the, the best path and more interested in making sure that whatever the path is, they wind up in, they're not left out alone on an island, that they're in the majority of whatever that is, kind of following the group, that sort of lemming instinct. Yeah, interesting. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the the dynamics of, of leading and, and different constituencies and stakeholders. I mean, we're a business podcast, so, but really relevant, you know, for business managing that. I'm curious, you know, you're, you're, you're younger, so you're in your early thirties. How do you experience the institution of, of the house of representatives as a younger person is the institute, you know, there's, you know, conversation about the institutions being able to adapt to the times and technology and everything else. How are you seeing that from your point of view? I would say it's actually a bit more technologically astute than maybe I had feared. That could just be having rock bottom expectations and, and, and a relatively low bar to clear. Um, you know, there are certainly some folks in the institution whose technological familiarity uh, could use some improving, but also a number of folks who've shown themselves to be incredibly understanding. I, I had a colleague that um, I wasn't aware of all the aspects of his background, and it wasn't until we were in a meeting on technology and, and this individual was speaking from a point of just extreme expertise. And, and usually when a member of Congress does that, it's because they have a staff member who's prepared really smart questions for them. But it was clear that he could go beyond just that, that rote question and, and understood the heart of it and then realized he worked for a couple of years at a, a, a tech VC. So you know, the body itself is incredibly diverse. And then some of the folks who maybe have simplistic external facing brands, or if you're just looking at what they're putting out on their social media platform, uh, remembering that that isn't necessarily reflective of who they are, because oftentimes communicating a very um, diverse and, and, and well-rounded experience is challenging in 180 characters. And so they are condensed down or 240 characters, excuse me, I'm behind on the times there. Uh, so they distill that down into whatever's the most readily consumable um, and fits that that simple narrative rather than the whole of a personality and individual. It's going to be TikTok soon, so, right? So let's stay on. Let, Depends on whether or not it's still banned. Let, let's stay yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's stay on the younger on the younger train there. So, how did you approach this? Um, what are some of the things you did without having any experience? So, a lot of leaders will come into a job for the first time with no experience, right? And this is kind of where you sit in. So, what are some of the things you did? You know, the first there was the first couple of days were probably a little less than normal. But what are some of the things you tried to do as a as a unexperienced, new to your position, uh, and assume some leadership? As with any anything that you know going in, there's going to be uh, 
elements that you can only learn on the job and, and parts of that that are going to be very nuanced that, you know, maybe somebody can tell you what it's like, but you never really absorb it until you're in that, that moment. But then there were just a lot of things that I had the opportunity to, to talk and be mentored and, and bounce ideas off of people who'd served in Congress before, people who were still serving but had long careers. And, and there was a host of resources out there to, to try to hit the ground running. And to the extent that when we arrived at new member orientation, I was quite pleasantly surprised that maybe 80% of what was being said, I had already kind of known going in. And so as you are able to narrow that shock group of those unknowns, um, you know, there's, you're never going to, and, and or you should, you confuse that you can, you're never going to know everything going in. And, and you have to retain a strong dose of humility, but just the ability to enter in uh, having established many of the prerequisites and creating a foundation upon which to overlay new information, I think is essential. And I found that to be very helpful because that meant that when more difficult decisions came down the pike, I wasn't still trying to get my feet wet on a few key things. It was, I was able to have in-depth and robust discussions because I had established that foundation upon which to build uh, the decision-making apparatus that I needed. How are you thinking about building your influence? You know, you're as a as a, a freshman um, congressman. H- how are you thinking about that? That's a challenge your undergraduates think about. You know, when they're starting a new job uh, or MBAs transitioning into a manager role. How are you thinking about building influence and credibility? I would say inside out and outside in. Um, you know, you have to understand the contours both internally within the entity, but also what are the external factors that are moving it in one direction or the other. I'll give you an example with um, the American Rescue Plan. I was working on a uh, on an alternative vision that had, you know, shaved a trillion dollars off of the cost, but almost doubled the direct you know, payment amounts from fourteen hundred dollars to twenty four hundred dollars. Now, usually, if you're trying to get a piece of legislation passed, because the Democratic majority is pretty slim, it's four or five votes, depending. Um, you, you go after the moderates in the middle because those are the folks that if you can get them on, on your side, um, along with the rest of your conference, you can then have uh, the ability to tilt the conversation and have the votes to get something else passed. In this case though, the, I knew that the, the moderates were, did not want to go, and whereas they may have been happy to not necessarily be aligned with Nancy Pelosi, they did not want to be unaligned with the Biden administration, especially early on with the signature um, component. So, okay, if I can't really work it inside out, now how do I work it outside in? And so, you know, launched a bit of a a media campaign. Now this was nascent. This was, um, we didn't have our our communication staff, you know, fully equipped yet. So it was, you know, not unfortunately a successful effort, but I think a, a good trial on how that might be. Because if you can't, with the dynamic as it is, if you're not able to get that persuasion and that influence, doing what I can to change that overall landscape, given the contours of the terrain externally. So I, that's going to be a very different application within a business environment as well, because a business shouldn't be as reactive to the media and, and to what the messaging landscape looks like. But I think it forces you to go creative and to make sure you understand among all those stakeholders, you know, what does their incentive structure look like? What are they how do they define success? How do they define victory? Um, and where might you be able to move them in one direction or another? And what will that take? So the, you know, speaking to the, the notion of different constituencies, you, you've got a lot of them and they're, you have competing points of view, you know, within your party, not, a, not only thinking about uh, the other party and you're, you're there as in leading and representing a diverse coalition, some people who voted for you, some people who didn't vote for you. And even the folks who did you know, vote for you can, can you know, see you and support you or, or not. Mm-hmm. How, are you, how are you thinking about managing just the diversity both within your party and outside your party and still being effective? I think if you start to break it down into a bunch of different subsects, you, know, you can drive yourself insane. Uh, I try to revert back to principles for that overall azimuth, for that trajectory. As long as I'm in aligned with those principles that I was elected on, that I, I communicated to my supporters, again, they may disagree on my assessment and they may disagree on whether or not 
my stance or vote on a particular issue is in alignment with those principles. But that becomes more of the need to communicate that alignment. Uh, otherwise, if, if every piece of legislation coming down, you know, goes through a 50-point checklist and, and you are, uh, you know, you do what you can with a relevant piece of, of legislation that may be impacting a certain community or another or an industry or a geography or an interest group, you know, folks who have a, a better understanding and can offer some color and context, you know, absolutely do that. But when it comes to other decisions, I think you have to you have to have a process of being able to distill down you know, what is the heart of the matter and, and now in alignment with the values and the principles that I ran on and that I hold, how should I exercise my judgment on, on the path that we should take? Do you take those, do you, when you're thinking about so let's, those- Let's maybe oh, go shift ahead. to- sure. Go ahead, Derek. I was gonna. I was gonna say, let's maybe switch switch to West Michigan, kind of where we're all we're all from and 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 operating. What do you see as you know? Uh, Grand Rapids has been thriving. West Michigan has been growing a lot lately. Um, what do you see as some of the pressing issues um, for for locally? Yeah, obviously, you know, we can't say what pressing issues are without mentioning COVID, getting through the end of the pandemic, supporting our economy in that process. You know, that's impacting us nationwide, but of course being felt here in West Michigan as well. I like to think that one of the distinguishing characteristics about West Michigan is this sense of investment in the community that, you know, a rising tide will lift all boats. We don't take a zero sum approach to investment or to civic or social cooperation. Uh, that's really where I try to see what can we do to, to best support that. And that oftentimes means ensuring that the federal government is not the the first resort, but the last resort. It's that if we can figure out ways of, of having that federal support be aligned with what we're already doing, if there will be federal support, make sure it's aligned with what good things are already occurring, uh, then we can reap those benefits. You know, we have some specific issues such as PFAS contamination in the water. Again, that's a national issue, but we're finding it here locally because we're looking for it because of incidents like the uh, Wolverine tannery, historic pollution up in Rockford. So that's something we absolutely need to address and have consistent federal standards around so we can remediate and ensure everyone has access to clean drinking water. Uh, the city of Grand Rapids has specific issues around lead contamination and um, in some of the urban areas where we have historic um, you know, lead paint issues that's been chipping and that's uh, caused a significant amount of lead uh, poisoning among, among the youth. And then you know, we don't really have a strong industrial concentration per se. We have a very well diversified economy, but we do have a significant amount of, of businesses that are very heavily invested in their community. So how can we make sure that we're taking a long-term approach towards investment? And a lot of that's going to happen locally. And so if it's a good thing that's already happening, making sure the federal government doesn't get in the way, but if it's an area where there might be a hurdle or two, um, then doing what we can to make sure that the federal government is acting as a supportive entity in that process and not making, you know, a, a difficult process unnecessarily challenging. How about higher education? Uh, lots of conversation, ton, even today, there are emails exchanged in our department about what, what is the future of education, you know, conversations of are degrees relevant? Is it certificates? Uh, and, and there's some initiatives coming from the governor, you know, focused on community colleges. And we've got obviously Western and Grand Valley and a lot of great community colleges here in West Michigan. What, what's your kind of point of view on, on the future of higher education here in West Michigan, the state of Michigan? Uh, that's something I haven't, or I used to spend a lot of time thinking about and discussing when I was chairman of the board at Student Veterans of America. And, and we helped, you know, get through the post 9-11 GI Bill and then thinking about the reintroduction of veterans um, and, and the job opportunities and career opportunities that presented themselves through higher education. I, I think that we need, we all too often have, you know, a college path and we have just a high school education. And, and there is a, a world of, of opportunities in the technical training side and, and having community college that's well aligned with uh, local employers uh, Grand Rapids Community College has you know, a stamping press that helps prepare some of its students to take on um, what can oftentimes be very, very fulfilling, lucrative pathways in the manufacturing industry. But you, I think some folks coming out of college feel that, that gap where you don't have the experience to get 
you know, the job or the path that you're hoping to do, but you can't find the opportunity to get that experience. And you're just kind of caught in, in the middle there. So to the extent that we can be having more support for apprenticeship programs, that can be a bit more of a blend, you know, that, that sense of on the job training uh, to better equip those who are entering the workforce to, to get matched with companies who are having labor shortages. Because I have yet to talk to an employer, and some of this is a little bit COVID specific, but a lot of this existed prior to COVID as well. I've yet to talk to an employer who isn't having issues finding the right talent, recruiting the right talent to fulfill the opportunities that they have. So how we can allow those two to connect where they need to and, and close the gap between what skills students leave school having and what skills that the employers need, you know, that's where I think we have a real opportunity. It's a really interesting time. We have endless debates about this now because the even some you know employers we've been speaking to you know start to question the do you need a degree or is it this kind of de-aggregated model where you can take take a certificate or some some courses at a community college you take a few courses here you take a few courses there some online that aren't even you know even here in West Michigan cobble those together I mean Google just came out with a a whole training program or a series of certificates. And it, uh, so it's an, and it's interesting to wonder what does that mean for the landscape of universities in Michigan? Will we continue to have the number of universities that we have um, or will that, will that change into the future? Um, I think yeah. the question that we oftentimes don't ask is, well, why are you getting the degree, right? I, I'm, I'm a very strong proponent of military service. And I think for those who may be finishing up high school, and don't yet have a clear cut sense of what they wanna do. And, and so don't necessarily have the understanding of what that educational pathway may be to attain that opportunity. Um, take time, you know, serve in the military, get exposed to a world beyond that which you inherently know through your upbringing so that when you do start to invest and plan on what career you may undertake, you have a, a greater sense of knowledge to drive, to drive that decision or base that decision off of. You know, all too often, if the expectation is, well, I'm you know, going to college because I'm going to college, well, maybe along the way, you'll find something you're really passionate about, and there's something to be said for, for that kind of liberal arts curriculum as well. Um, but I think that needs to be aligned well with expectations on the other side, or else we're just perpetuating you know, folks taking on degrees that um, don't, aren't setting them up on a pathway towards long-term financial stability and success. We're almost, we're almost out of time. I'd love to um, ask though about, as you, you kind of bring up military service, you, you, you've you served, mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you, you know, and, and you start to see a, a, a discrepancy between, you know, a, you know, it seems like the, the, communities that are serving are sometimes not around communities that are not serving and, and, the, and the kind of overlap there. What are the lessons that you have drawn from your experience in the military that you're now bringing to Congress, bringing into your professional life? I would say first and foremost, if you feel like you have a mission, if, if a group feels like it has a mission, then you never hear somebody say, well, that's not my job, right? Because everyone, you might have a specific set of requirements that are asked of you and expectations, but if there's a gap between where your role ends and where somebody else's begins in a mission-oriented environment, we will move, move to fill that. Uh, and I, that's something that I, I miss. Um, you know, feeling when I was, especially on the veteran disaster response side, I remember having somebody ask me, it's like, well, what have you done? And it was just such a foreign concept. It's like, well, we're, we're done when the mission's done or we're done when we're replaced. It's not like, okay, like check, you know, five o'clock, I'm tuning out, you know, so aligning that, that, um, that mission with that it gives that underlying sense of purpose. But I would say more broadly from that, it's the idea of, of leadership is so easily said and so hard to fully inculcate um, in, in a military environment. You know, you, you followed people who not only were self-possessed and, and knew what to do themselves, but who could also extend beyond themselves to, to offer something to the group as well. And, and I've been impressed by um, some of my colleagues in Congress who are you, know, you, you can tell the folks who are there just for their own self-promotion, who are there just to build a brand, who are there just to fundraise and, and ensconce themselves in a, you know, a lucrative and um, an important role. And then they like the trappings and the, the prestige. And, and those who say, I have, I have a vision, I want to execute on that vision, but more so I want to lead others you know, in, in a certain direction. 
And the idea of transformative leadership, which I saw time and again in the military, and I think it was incredibly operative, you know, where you don't just tell the crowd what they want to hear. You don't, you know, speak to your soldiers and, and tell them um, that everything's good. You say, okay, we may be here. Here's where we need to go. And I've been disappointed at how reactive leadership can often be in a political environment where you're not moving people to in a better direction. You're just validating that where they are is exactly where they should be. And, and that's not leadership. I mean, that's, that's management. That's, um, that's accepting the status quo rather than you know, offering a vision for how to improve upon it and lead folks down a better path. Is that a social media effect, do you think? The, or the reactiveness or? It's social media, it's fundraising, it's, it's the media environment more generally. Um, you know, the reality is for a lot of folks in office, they have nothing to gain by telling folks things they don't want to hear. They have everything to gain by um, preaching to the choir and, and ensuring that they can continue to get reelected. Uh, if they were to take, you know, politicians are some of the most risk averse people you'll ever meet. You know, they, they like to put themselves out as being very risky and, and, and taking, you know, bold leaps, but all too often it's backed up by polling numbers or off of assurances in one way, shape or form. So I think it's, that can be rather debilitating because it breeds within the individual a sense of insecurity. And then if all you're thinking about is, is self-preservation and looking over your shoulder, you know, what kind of leader are you ultimately going to be able to be? Right. It's great. So let's, uh, let's mindful of time here. Let's wrap up with some rapid fire questions. These are one word kind of answers. Are you ready? I will try to be. All right, here we go. Here we go. Favorite leader. Gerald Ford. Uh, courage or compassion? Compassionate courage. <laughs> uh, speed or accuracy? Speed. Great ideas or great execution? Execution. A word to describe your leadership style? Hopefully thoughtful. Are you a night owl or early bird? A night owl that aspires to be an early bird. Uh, Meyer or Myers? As you wish. <laughs> Pickup or delivery? Delivery. Uh, if, if you're walking into a dangerous jungle, it's a difficult task. Who are you going to bring with you? Buddies from Team Rubicon. All right. And to close out, if you had an animal that reflected your leadership, what would be your, your animal? I hope you can shorten some of the pauses here and, and clip that. <laughs> um, you're, 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 you said thoughtful as your leadership style, so it works. Yeah. But then I'm trying to think of a, a, a thoughtful animal and maybe a fox. A fox. Mm -hmm. and, and why would you say a fox? Uh, I, I think being deliberate, but um, committing as well when the path is, has been chosen. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, Representative Peter Meyer, we appreciate you joining us on The Jungle. Thank you, Doug. Really appreciate it.